My name is Rick Houlihan. I am a principal TPM, a technical product manager. I work on the uh, database services team. I, I am actually working on the next generation of DynamoDB. Uh, but we're here today to talk to you a little bit about what we have uh, as far as uh, DynamoDB today. It's a managed NoSQL service offering from Amazon, and we'll talk a little bit about what that means. Um, so the first part of the presentation today, we'll go through a little bit of a history of data processing. I like to do this with uh, uh, groups that I talk to because it level sets why we're even looking at NoSQL. Uh, it actually talks a little bit about the history of data processing and, and really the fact that we're facing the same problem today that we faced repeatedly in the past. History tends to repeat itself, and we'll talk a little bit about why. Uh, we'll get into DynamoDB internals, uh, the table, structure, API, data types, indexing structures, and whatnot. Uh, you know, scaling and data, data modeling mechanics. I will get into design patterns and best practices, and I'll leave you with a little bit of discussion around uh, what we're starting to market as serverless applications or event-driven application development uh, you know, using DynamoDB streams uh, and, and DynamoDB as a backplane service. What is a database? A place to stick stuff, okay? And, and, and that's how most developers start, right? We build applications, there's a database, hey, cool, I can push things there, persist my data, I can, you know, I can relaunch my app later on, I can retrieve the data and I can work with it. And we just kind of start using it like a dumping ground, right? Well, unfortunately, that's how the data, that's how your application will scale, right? It will dictate how your application will scale over time. So understanding how to use the database, how to use the technology that you're using efficiently uh, is going to drive whether or not you're going to have to rebuild your entire stack uh, down the road when a million users show up. If we look out uh, through the history of database technology, what we see is a repeating situation. Uh, it, it peaks and valleys in data, what I call data pressure. Right? Data pressure is the ability of a system to process the amount of data is being asked to process at a reasonable cost or at a reasonable time frame. Okay, so over time we've seen this happen repeatedly throughout history. You can call this a series of high water marks. What happens at these high water marks, these are technology triggers, right? This is where we invent new things, right? New stuff to do the work that we are asking our systems to do. So the first system we had, the first database we had was the one between our ears. And it was an excellent database, right? Highly available, very low latency, uh, but a single, single user system, questionable durability, zero fault tolerance, right? Uh, you know, there's no, no backup, no, no restore, right? We didn't like that, so we figured out that, you know, in order for us to persist the data that we were storing, we need to write things down, right? So we started developing a system of ledger accounting. Ledger accounting was really a database, right? Structured data written on, written down in tabular form uh, that drove business and, and, and infrastructure for, for millennia. Right, uh, and really, when did that stop? That stopped in the 1880 U.S. Census time frame, right? When uh, Herman Hollerith <laughs> was tasked with processing the data of the U.S. Census in 1880, and found it took eight years of the 10-year interval to process the amount of data they collected in 1880. He realized, I need a better system. When 1890 rolls around, I'm not going to be able to get this done in time. So he invented the machine-readable punch card, uh, and uh, you know, history of modern data processing was born. Uh, so what we're starting to see is a trend, right? As business starts to, you know, as we invent new technologies, business starts to adopt those technologies. They find new use cases, new applications, new ways of using more and more data, and the data processing pressure, the data pressure on our processing infrastructure increases. So, what came next? <laughs> uh, data drums. Uh, tape, serial tape, right? Uh, the way we access data started to become dependent upon the way we, did, we stored it, right? If I wanted to access a file that was on, stored on tape, I had to read all the way through the tape to a certain point and be able to get that data, right? Not a very efficient way to store data. We developed the random access file system, distributed block storage, right? And data sprawl began in the modern data center. And what drove uh, the innovation, of the, the, uh, the next innovation was really the cost of that distributed data store, right? The, you know, the file system, the sprawl of file systems developed drove the innovation, which was what we now commonly refer to as the relational database system, right? It was driven, it was delivered <laughs> to, or built uh, to reduce the footprint of data on disk. Disk was the most expensive uh, resource in the data center in the 60s, right? In the, in the 70s, and maybe even arguably the 80s, right? You could still say that Disk storage was really the most costly investment that data center operators had to make on a daily basis, right? Provisioning of storage in the enterprise never stops. Uh, so what do we do today? Um, you know, when we look at the, the cost of infrastructure today, now it's the cost of the CPU is where we have to spend the most money. Storage is cheap, 
right? I can put data up on S3. I, you know, I can store massive amounts of data, three cents a gigabyte. Uh, you know, cloud storage is available for multiple vendors. Uh, I don't necessarily have to worry about the size of the data anymore. What I need to worry about is the cost of processing the data, uh, the cost of CPU, right? Back in the 60s, a CPU was a fixed asset. It was something I bought. It was part of the system. If it wasn't processing data, it was spinning. Uh, today, I actually pay for those CPU cycles, right? So why would I use a technology that was built to solve problem of the past to solve the problems that I'm facing today? So we want to look at something new. We want to look at distributed database technologies like NoSQL. What does this really mean as you know, developers and as business owners? It's about data. It's about that we talked about data pressure. Uh, the, the data pressure, this picture has never been different for the last 150 years. It's been the same, right? 90% of the data stored today is, is generated in the last two years. You can Google this, it's out there. IDC, Forrester has acknowledged, acknowledged this number. IBM did some research on this as well. Uh, it's a pretty well accepted fact. So what does that really mean? That means that one terabyte of data in 2010 is equal to 6.5 petabytes of data today. All right, 6,500 times more data today. And I see this all the time as an SA, I would deal with customers, and, and five, six years ago, they were talking to me about their multi-terabyte databases, and they're saying, you know, hey, maybe we'll be in the 100 terabyte or 200 terabyte range within four or five years. And these same customers, right, same people I'm talking to today are now talking to me about how, how am I going to deal with these petabytes of data that are, we have, you know, floating around, okay? So it is not a problem that is going away. It is not a problem that is going to change in the future, and it, there's a linear correlation between this data pressure right, that we see, these peaks and valleys. There's a linear correlation between that and uh, the technical innovations that we see in the data processing field. We're all probably familiar with this bottom chart. That's the, you know, the, the technology adoption curve, we all say, right? There's a, you know, in the beginning, we have many options. We have all these little ideas, and some of them are good, and some of them are bad, and eventually, you know, the early adopters figure out which ones those are, right? Smart companies come in in the early majority and they say, hey, you guys all figured out the problems, right? We're gonna start deploying this stuff to solve these problems. Uh, and then, you know, the late majority and so on. But what happens, what's interesting, what happens with companies that eventually run to these new technologies early is they have this enormous hype curve, right? Hey, look, so-and-so, you know, it's no SQL technology. It's a distri distributed database that's gonna solve all of our big data problems. Just deploy MongoDB, just deploy Cassandra. Right, it'll fix everything. And they run in there and they go out and they start to deploy the technologies and they build applications on it and they find out that, you know, this stuff doesn't work. None of it works, right? Oh, I've got use cases that don't apply, right? My, my, my app is not good for, for no SQL. And I've heard that so many times, right? It's not even funny. Um, but the reality is that every app is fine for NoSQL. It's about using the tool the way it was meant to be used. If you're trying to design a relational schema and you push it into a NoSQL platform, you're gonna have a very bad experience, right? So you have to learn how to use the technology if you're gonna have a good experience. And this is one of the things I talk to people is avoid that peak of inflated expectation. Learn how to use this new technology. Talk to people who've had success. How did they use it? figure out how these things are supposed to work and you'll have a better experience, right? You'll be on that slope of enlightenment right away. Uh, and so that's a lot of what I deal with with companies is teaching them how to forget what they used to know and, and how to use you know, the new platforms. Why would I use NoSQL technology? We've had this great thing called SQL for many, many years. It solved all of our problems. Uh, you know, what's, the, what's the big deal? Well, SQL is fantastic technology. <laughs> you know, for ad hoc queries. If I don't understand the access pattern, if my users are coming in and they're asking me questions, and it could be, you know, BI analytics maybe, uh, you know, somebody sitting in the back office and gonna ask different questions today than they did yesterday, well, it's probably not a good technology to use. No, SQL is not a good technology to use. SQL is a very flexible technology that way. I can ask many questions of the data. I can perform ad hoc queries and aggregations. Um, you know, the problems with SQL is it scales vertically, right? It meaning I have to get a bigger box if I wanna run a bigger database. Well, sooner or later, I can't get a bigger box. So <laughs> we, have, we have a fundamental problem here. It was not built to be able to run in a partitioned, uh, easily run uh, as a partitioned data store. Uh, so really, it's good for OLAP, good for those online analytics, processing workloads, data warehousing, things like this. This is a fantastic application for SQL technology. Uh, no SQL, on the other hand, it's denormalized. It's what I call hierarchical views of your data, right? Pre-joined, pre-aggregated views. Um, what you'd say instantiated views. OLTP, this is the place, this is the sweet spot for NoSQL. Why? Because NoSQL schema is designed 
to support the access pattern, specifically support the access pattern, right? Uh, I don't join NoSQL databases. I, I, I read the view that's out of the NoSQL database. It's pre-joined for all intents and purposes. And we'll talk a little bit about what that means. Uh, but you know, suffice to say, we spend a lot of less time hopping around the disk, pulling data out of various tables, assembling views, because I'm basically doing big select statements out of my NoSQL tables all the time. I'm never taking records, merging them, joining them. The aggregations are stored on disk the way the application needs them. And it is all about aggregations for OLTP applications. If you think about it, I'm always looking at you know, orders by users, invoices by orders, payments on invoices, right? There's always a dimension in which I'm looking at records aggregated into a particular you know, dimension when I'm looking at OLTP data, uh, and it's consistent, right? Every time the transaction runs through the system, guess what it does? It uses the data the same way every time. I can count on it. It's not going to change. When the guy clicks the buy button, I'm going to I'm going to execute a, tra a, you know, a, a transaction against what the contents of his shopping cart, and it's going to be the same way every time. So we can actually optimize the data structure to support that. SQL is agnostic to the access pattern. It is, means it's optimized for none, right? If I, oh, whereas at, where NoSQL is specifically designed to support the access pattern, it is optimized for that access pattern, right? It is, not, it is not agnostic to the access pattern. This is what's important. Basically, every type of application we build is going to look at data uh, in, some sort of in some sort of aggregation. This is SQL. This is a relational structure we're very familiar with. Um, this represents all the common types of relationships you see in, in, a, in a RDBMS. This is a product catalog, a products table. Products table has a one-to-one -one relationship between books, albums, and videos in itself. There's one-to-many between albums and tracks. Tracks and albums can have many tracks. And there's a many-to-many -many between videos and actors. Actors can be in many videos, and videos can be in many actors. Or, and, 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 and videos can have many actors. So if you think about what happens when I want to see, OK, let, give me all the products that are videos in this particular you know, uh, uh, data structure. OK, let me select from products, interjoin videos on product ID. You know, I, oh, let's interjoin actor video on the, on the video ID, and then join through that table to get to the, you know, the actual actors for my video. Think what the CPU is doing to be able to assemble that view. right? It's going and finding the, the products. It goes and maps those product IDs to the videos. It puts these rows together. Then it goes through another table and another table. This is the cost of SQL. This is why SQL will not scale. It just cannot scale. Because again, it's agnostic to the access patterns, which means to produce the result set, it has to do a lot of work. All right? So let's take a look at what that looks like in, in no SQL. Right? Let me get all my products. You know, let alone just all my videos. I can get all my videos easy enough, but I can just select all my products just simply by selecting star from the products table, right? A select star is always going to be a faster query than a select star, interjoin this, interjoin that, interjoin this, always. This is why no SQL performance will blaze over SQL at scale through OLTP applications. You, you, it's amazing the performance difference between a well-designed uh, no SQL schema and a relational schema for most complex uh, uh, relational database schemas. One of the probably understated and most valuable features of Dynamo is the fact that it's a fully managed NoSQL database platform. I talk to customers all the time who are starting out with you know, uh, uh, MongoDB or Cassandra or you name it, and they have like dozens of little projects. No, it's great. The developers can get running, and I love these databases. Don't get me wrong. I, I was at MongoDB for two years. Fantastic database, okay? Uh, the problem with these things is when you scale. It's not when you get started. It's when these business units and these apps and these services start to actually become successful, you start to scale, and you start to see the operational burden of managing 100, 200, 1,000, 1,500 instances of your database when you used to manage uh, five, right? Uh, this is, this is, a, is a huge cost, right, that the customers have to pay to actually scale these applications. So looking at a fully managed service that provides a NoSQL database is pretty, pretty attractive. Most of the customers I talk to are customers who are looking to come off of their you know, large scale you know, either, and these could be you know, on-prem in their own data centers, or they could be in EC2. I work with customers who are, I think, yes, I, I'm not going to mention customer names because I'm not sure who I'm cleared to talk about. But I do I work with customers who have made large-scale migrations from on-prem MongoDB into EC2. Or they're still running MongoDB, they're running an EC2, but even then the cost is still killing them. So they come to me and they say, how can I move all this stuff into DynamoDB? 
right? And so, I, I mean, I do a lot of these types of migrations. There are two flavors, I guess you'd say, primary flavors of NoSQL these days, the document and key value store. Uh, DynamoDB does its best to support both at its heart, at its core, it's a key value store. We do support document attributes, right? So as part of the, the value of the key value can actually be a JSON document. We'll talk a little bit about how we uh, access that data. Uh, you know, again, one of the biggest value points we have, fast and consistent at any scale. So design goal for the system was, was single digit millisecond latency uh, at any scale. And we have customers that are doing millions of transactions per second, billions of transactions per day, and seeing exactly that. Very consistent, sub, sub 10 millisecond, actually low single digit millisecond. In the case of guys like AdRoll, uh, these guys are, are, are doing over a million requests per second at peak, and their 99.5 percentile latency is, is less than three milliseconds. So amazing scale. Uh, Fine-grained access control, document level, attribute level access control, fully integrated with uh, AWS IAM. Uh, so, you know, and IAM is also in turn integrated with LDAP, Kerberos, other en the enterprise auth management. So you can tie into your Active Directory uh, and actually authorize, you know, use, use Active Directory roles and permissions to um, associate to your IAM users, which will then grant access and permissions to DynamoDB data. Uh, and a backplane service, again, fully managed, something that you don't need to worry about, which means that uh, it's always there, it's always on. You know, how do I deploy DynamoDB? You log into the console, you create a table. You tell me how much capacity you want on the table, uh, and then you get, and, and, and that's it. No deploying instance, uh, update software, no install software, configure things. Uh, you know, th it's just, uh, just a very simple process. So what does a table look like? Table's pretty simple, table has items. This is just similar to very, uh, you know, many uh, NoSQL platforms, uh, no different. Items can have attributes. Attributes don't need to be consistent across items. You can have uh, any number of attributes in an item. In DynamoDB, there is one mandatory attribute. It's called the partition key, all right? The, the partition key uh, uniquely identifies the item. It's an ad any attribute, but you specify. You say, I want the user ID to be my partition key. And then every item that you insert into that table must have a user ID attribute. That's the only mandatory attribute. There's another attribute that you can push that was called a sort key. Uh, the sort key is really a, a way of creating a composite key. Now, when I add a sort key, instead of the, the partition key uniquely identifying, uniquely identifying the item, the combination of the two uniquely identifies the item. Why would I use a sort key? Because sort keys support range queries, all right? Range queries are complex query operators, things like equals, greater than, less than, begins with, contains. Range keys support the ability to execute queries and filtered, get extremely selective and filtered result sets in a sorted order based on the key value, all right? So we'll explain a little bit why, about why is this important, but try to remember it's if you want to get you know, uh, items between a certain date, you know, orders that happen for this customer between a certain date. These are types of queries that you would execute against a sort key operator. Okay, so the partition key, as we said, uniquely identifies the item. We'll take that partition key, we'll take the attribute that you specify. In this case, we're gonna say that the hash key is the ID attribute. Every item has an ID attribute. We'll apply a hash algorithm to generate a uniquely random value out of that value, and we will then realign these items and lay them out across what we call a key space. Uh, when, the, when the table has a single server, or it's a very small table and it runs on a single server, the entire key space is served by a single storage node. If the table grows or increases in capacity, uh, then we would start to split that key space. And this is how NoSQL databases work, right? All NoSQL databases work this way. They, they take some attribute, some value out of the document, and they will apply either a hash algorithm or they'll use the straight value, and they will, uh, they will sort those records across a key space, and then as you scale the system, they'll just chunk the key space and start handing it off to different nodes in the cluster, right? So this is what gives the NoSQL database uh, the ability to scale horizontally. And this is how it looks like when you have the partition, the sort key, you know, table, right, when I've specified a sort key, now what happens is all of the items with the same partition key will get co-located on the same storage node. They'll actually get laid out on disk, sorted by the sort key value. Why is this important? Because when we go to get the records and you say, give me all the orders for this customer between this date, I'm just going to go do one big sequential read on the disk. So, just, so we got two things going for us. We got a big select statement. Those are always fast. We love select statements, no joins. And then we got a large sequential read. 
This is one of the reasons why DynamoDB is going to give you single-digit millisecond latency, low single-digit millisecond latency all the time, because when we go query the data store, we're doing it very selectively, and we're, and we're doing it very efficiently. So partitions by default are three-way replicated. When you write to DynamoDB, we're going to write across three partitions. Those three partitions are in three AZs. Uh, even in regions that only have one or two AZs, which we do have a few of those, there's still three AZs for DynamoDB. It's what we call a backplane service. So you may not, as a customer, see three AZs. It doesn't mean they aren't there. A region doesn't actually stand up without it because we can't stand up DynamoDB without it. So anyways, you issue a write to DynamoDB. We're going to write to two of those servers. It'll replicate to the third. When the two servers that we write to come back and confirm the write's been written, you're going to get an acknowledgment that the write's been committed. Okay? When we read, we will read from two servers, and we will give you the most current version that comes back. That's what makes DynamoDB a consistent read-after-write database, just like MongoDB. MongoDB is also a consistent read-after-write database. There's no master-master type of functionality here. Now, you can choose to turn on, I guess you'd say, uh, uh, eventually consistent reads, and when you do that, what happens is we actually just read from any one node randomly. You get whatever data it has. Why would you do that? Because it will cut your read cost in half. Right? We're only reading from, you know, in a normal read, I read from two nodes. On an EC read, I read from one node, so I only charge you half uh, the read capacities. That's a very cheap way. Most workloads will support eventually consistent reads. I mean, we're talking about milliseconds, not minutes, right? Uh, most, most workloads are just fine with that, uh, and it's a very, you know, very easy way to optimize your cost on DynamoDB. Just turn on eventually consistent reads, you double your read capacity. Indexes in DynamoDB are rather interesting. We have two flavors. We have the local, what we call local secondary index, and we have a global secondary index. We'll talk about the local first. Uh, the local is, in essence, it's a way to give us an alternate sort key attribute. We mentioned sort keys. We have the range key and the sort key. I can execute you know, uh, uh, complex filter queries against the sort key. Well, oftentimes I need to execute those types of queries against more than just the sort attribute. I need to execute those types of queries against other attributes in the item. Uh, we can do that in two ways. I can create a local secondary index to do that. That gives me a nice, selective, highly selective way of doing it because I can filter on the sort key attribute. I can get that down to the, hey, I need this block of items. I'll do a sequential read against it, right? Or I can do it using a filter, filter condition. Filter condition's a little different. It'll read all the records on the bucket and then filter out the ones that don't match. So filters are more expensive. Indexes are more efficient on the read side. But like all database indexes on the right side, I got to write the data twice, right, when I do when I create an index. Uh, so again, so I create an alternate sort key, and I can, with DynamoDB indexes, you can project additional attributes into the index, right? So I will sort on this secondary attribute, and I will let you say, and also, by the way, append these other attributes, because when I query the index, I'm going to want to read these other attributes too. Right. You know that that's the, you know, in, your, in your app, that's the access pattern. If I'm looking for data on that dimension, I'm also looking for these other attributes as well. Project those attributes into the index so I don't have to read the index and then go back to the table and read the items. Global secondary indexes are a little different. Uh, they allow us to specify a completely different partition and sort key. Okay, so think of this as a totally different aggregation. So on my primary table, maybe I'm aggregating uh, you know, parts uh, by assembly, right? Uh, but then I also need to see parts by manufacturer or parts by, uh, you know, uh, you know the, uh, by, by lot number or whatever, right? I can create an, a, a GSI or a global secondary index, and I can, I can have a totally different partition key on those items. As they're inserted in the primary table, they might be falling into aggregations that are by assembly. And then when I go and run the GSI, uh, the GSI is going to spin that on its completely different dimension and create a totally different aggregation. And now I have, in essence, what amounts to a different one-to-many relationship pre-built into this GSI than I do on the table. All right? And we'll talk about a little bit about how, how those play. Um, GSI updates are, are eventually consistent. Right? So you're going to upgrade, update the table. You're going to get acknowledged back to the client that you've been updated. The index is going to get it in a second or two. Well, not a second or two, usually less than a second. Uh, but they're not going to necessarily happen in line with the updates. That's how that works. Uh, the response is asynchronous to the update of the GSI. LSIs are consistent. Okay. So that's a good big difference. And the, diff the reason why is because GSIs maintain a totally different ordered aggregation. LSIs generally maintain the same aggregation by the same dimension because it's just a different sort key. So I can co-locate the LSI on the same partition as the GSI, makes it a lot easier for me to synchronize the updates across the two. In the GSI, the partition sets are going to be totally different than the main table. 
in essence, the key space is totally different. So in, if you update the, the, the primary table, it's now a distributed computing problem to synchronize the update to the GSI. We basically punted on that, said too hard, we're just gonna create an eventually consistent GSI. So when do you use LSIs or GSIs? You know, if eventual consistency is okay for your scenario, I always recommend the GSI because it's more flexible. GSIs can always be created uh, and, and deleted at any time. LSIs can only be created uh, when the table is created and they can never be deleted. So this is something to remember when you're starting to set these things up. A little bit more flexibility when you use the GSI. There's also a 10 gigabyte limit to the LSI. If you're gonna create a LSI on a table, it limits the partition size to 10 gigabytes, uh, and that's because they need to co-locate. We talked a little bit about partitioning and how important that is, and it really comes down to how we scale. Uh, DynamoDB scales in two dimensions, throughput and size. Uh, provision any amount of throughput to a table, that's up to you. You come into the console, you say, I want 10,000 WCUs. Uh, a WCU is a write capacity unit. We'll talk a little bit about what that means in a second. Um, the, you know, then, of course, size is you can add any number of items to the table. The maximum item size today is 400 kilobytes. Uh, and, of course, we have this little limit with the LSIs where the size of a partition uh, or the number of range keys per partition uh, is limited to 10 gigabytes. Uh, but in essence, you can, you know, for all practical purposes, we can put any number of items on the table and have tables of any size. There is no limit. Throughput is provision at the table level. Write capacity units are measured as one kilobyte per second. Uh, read capacity units are measured at four kilobytes per second. RCUs, by default, measure those strictly consistent reads. As we talked about, you can turn those off and cut your cost in half, and they're adjusted completely independently. So you can set any number of read capacity and write capacity. I can consume 100% of my read capacity. It's not gonna affect the availability of the write capacity uh, and vice versa. As far as partitioning goes, here's how it works as far as, as, as what it looks like on the table at a given point. Your capacity number divided by, take your total RCU, divide by 3,000. Take your total WCU, divide by 1,000. Add those two numbers together and round up. That's how many partitions that I would need to support my table by the capacity that you have set. So if I provision a table with 9,000 RCUs, it needs three partitions, right? By size, it's really easy. It's just the size of the table divided by 10 gigabytes. That's how many partitions you'll get. We'll take the larger of those two numbers, and we can't give you a fractional, so if we look at some real numbers there, this is how that would work out for a table of eight gigabytes, 5,000 RCUs, 500 WCUs. By capacity, I need 2.17. By size, I need 0 0.8. I'm gonna take the max of those two numbers with 2.17, round up, you're gonna get three partitions on your table. So, okay, that's interesting, why is that important? Important because of this, in order to do the capacity provisioning for your table, we are going to evenly distribute the RCUs and WCUs across three partitions. What does that really mean? It means on a per partition basis, your throughput is 166 uh, WCUs and 1,666 RCUs per partition. If I start to hit any particular partition key harder than that, I might actually get throttled, even though the table has 5,000 RCUs. Right, if I'm reading it faster, if I'm reading a particular key faster than 1,666 RCUs, I might end up getting throttled because the individual partition it's on doesn't have the throughput to support it. Now there is burst capacity built in the system. We don't want to just create a hard wall where people fall over. You get five minutes of unused capacity. It sits in a burst bucket that's available for you on a per partition basis, right? Uh, across all your partitions, uh, but except it, it's a best guess. It's a best effort, right, that you'll get that. So don't count on burst, it'll be there for you most of the time, but if other people have provision tables and the provision capacity is being consumed and there's no headroom on the storage node, then you're gonna get throttled. What causes throttling? We kinda just went through it. If that sustained throughput goes beyond the uh, provision throughput on a per partition basis, uh, these can be caused, you know, access patterns are caused by non-uniform workloads, what we call hot keys, right? Hot partitions, uh, and, you know, high velocity reads, high velocity writes to with single partition key value. Uh, those can be what we call hot keys. Uh, large aggregations, large bursts of traffic, mixing hot data with cold data. If you think about a lot of operational analytics, right, we bring in the data and we're only interested in that data for some period of time. It might be 24 hours or a week or a month. After that, the data gets old, it gets stale, nobody looks at it. If I sit there and keep on filling that table up, the table's gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. It's just gonna split, 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 split. And every time I split, I'm rate limiting, I'm rate limiting, I'm rate limiting. So, you know, if you got a bunch of data that you don't care about, then don't leave it in the DynamoDB table. If you do, and we'll talk about design pattern for that, 
let's create a staggered set of aging tables, right? So we age the data out, right? This data is only good for 30 days. Every 30 days, I'll create a new table and start writing new data to it, things like this, right? Uh, manage the table uh, based on how you're accessing the data. This is what throttling looks like. This is what we call bad NoSQL, and it's the same in DynamoDB, MongoDB, Cassandra, you name it. We all have our anti-patterns that will create this effect. I pull these for customers quite frequently. This is looking at the partition set of the table on the y-axis and the access pattern over time. And what you can see is this guy's got one little storage node up there that's blazing hot because don't know why. Maybe there's a large aggregation that we're importing and detailing a whole pile of data in and millions of records are coming in in one big batch load and we're trying to shove it all into one partition. Um, you know, maybe it's a vel high velocity counter. Somebody's trying to maintain counters on a DynamoDB item. Maybe not the best place to do that. I've had customers try to maintain that kind of transient high velocity counter in a DynamoDB item. This is going to create a hot key. Maybe we should use something like Elastic Cache or an app layer cache for that. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, especially if it's transient data, data that's going to repopulate or can be easily rebuilt. And don't, don't need to store that in a database, these types of things. Um, those cause those access patterns. So to get the most out of Dynamo, really what it comes down to is creating uh, uh, tables where the uh, hash key element has a large, uh, high cardinality set, right? True, false does not make a good hash key. That means that everything's going to be in one or two, right? Uh, you know, these types of things are not good. So avoid those binary hash keys. UUIDs, UUIDs make excellent hash keys. Unfortunately, for most applications, that's fairly useless. Uh, the, the, you know, the key thing is to understand what kind of aggregations I'm trying to maintain on the table. How thick, how big, how deep are these things? Uh, you know, if I've got aggregations that require millions and millions of items, then let's talk about design patterns that allow us to spread those things out across multiple hash key values instead of just one. Um, you know, and then the other thing I want is I want those uh, hash key elements to be uh, accessed or requested fairly uniformly and as randomly as possible. And that's great. The first one we can handle that space. I can always design a schema that will distribute the access pattern. We can always do this. Uh, the, 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 the time, time's another one. Time is, you know, hey, the thundering herd shows up tomorrow because I had the most successful, you know, promo ever in the history of my company. Uh, nothing can help you with that, right? So we have to, have to build the ability of the application to react uh, to that in an elastic way into our architecture. And, and we can talk about some of those design patterns. If we accomplish those things, this is what it looks like. Much better picture, right? We've got, you know, it actually looks a little bit more uh, colorful than this uh, because we would see a more, you know, spread access pattern across the space. Uh, but you get the idea. Uh, we don't want a lot of key pressure on any given partition. We want that pressure to be more evenly distributed across the cluster. So let's talk a little bit about data modeling. We talked about those one-to-one, one-to-many, -one, one many-to-many -many relationships, very common structures in relational databases. This is how we maintain those in DynamoDB. Um, and, you know, the use case here would be you know, getting pulled over by the highway patrol. Um, you know, and I, I need to give them my license. They got to get my social security number, or my, my contact info. They don't necessarily need my social security number. Uh, but when I go to the DMV and get my license, they want my social security number and all that birth certificate and all that stuff, right? It's a one-to-one -one thing, right? You have one one uh, you know, social security number, one license. Uh, so maybe when I get my license at the DMV, I have a user's table, it's partitioned on social security, it's got all my email attributes, which is really bad PII, we're not gonna worry about that. I'm sure they don't use social security number at the DMV, actually I'm not so sure, but. <laughs> Uh, you know, I get pulled over by the Highway Patrol. Highway Patrol system's all hooked up to a different table. It's actually a GSI on the user's table, and it's partitioned on the license, and, you know, and just gives me those attributes, right? So this is a, a partition-only table that we just flip the keys around, right? So that gives me that one-to-one -one relationship. I can make those access, those lookups uh, on the two different access patterns using that base table and the GSI this way. The next one we'll talk about is the one-to-many relationship. This is uh, it basically built into the table structure using a partition sort key. A uh, particular you know, common example here, IoT type of scenario, given a device, you know, find all the readings that were taken between these particular timestamps. Okay, so I use a table structure that has a partition key of the device ID and a, and a sort key that is the timestamp. Every time I take a reading off the device, it comes into the DynamoDB table with a different timestamp. It's got the same device ID. I can lay those records out nice and, you know, in a linear fashion on disk. I execute the query that says give it between these two timestamps. Very easy to find the records are associated with that device between those timestamps. Many, many relationships. Uh, this is using a, you know, partition sort key. Uh, and then flipping them around. So a particular use case here would be uh, for a user video game, online gaming, 
For a user, find all the games that they play. And for a game, find all the users that play it. So I have a user games table partitioned on the user ID and sorted on the game ID. Bob plays a bunch of games. He's got a bunch of items in his hash key. When I go into on the, on the game users table, I'm just going to flip those around. I'm just going to say now my partition key is the game ID and my sort key is the, is the user ID. So now I can query the game ID and get all the list of users that are, play, that are playing that game. And on the, on the, if I want to see what, you, what games a particular user plays, it's very easy to query the users table. So you can imagine all the workflows and access patterns that this supports, right? Uh, you know, in online gaming, users show up, they want a game match, right? By, you know, what kind of games do you play? How good are you? What's your skill level? Uh, what not? Um, you know, these are the types of, of tables that those types of companies end up creating quite frequently. The next one we'll talk about is hierarchical data. Hierarchical data is, is really about how OLTP apps use the data. Right, we talked about you know the these relational structures that we you know and back in the day you know when we build a relational database it was pretty easy I could just say what kind of, what data do you need I just identify the elements that the, the relationships in the database normalize everything put it in third normal form uh, you know and and then I then I just tweak the queries to support what the application developers required now it's not quite so easy in NoSQL I need to understand exactly what the developers need how they what the access pattern is so that I can build this structure for it uh, but. <laughs> The reality is I, what I'm doing is I'm building these hierarchical structures using entity-driven workflows, right? A user, an invoice, a payment, right? Um, you know, the data gets spread out across these tables and it requires complex queries in SQL to assemble all this and we don't want that. So how do I represent those structures in, in DynamoDB? So let's take a look at that relational structure that was distributed out across multiple tables. And there's a couple ways that we can maintain hierarchical structures uh, in DynamoDB. In this particular example, what we've done is we've uh, created multiple items and we've created hierarchies uh, under each product ID. So uh, for, a, for a book, there's only one item. Books were, you could remember, as a one-to-one -one relationship. So uh, I can build the one item for the book. It has all the properties of the book. Uh, now for albums, I have multiple tracks per album. So I would have a product ID and then an album ID and then maybe you know album concatenated with track ID, uh, you know, so on and so forth. And then I would be able to build the hierarchy of albums and tracks. And the same with movies and actors. Right. So what, I, what, I've, what have I really done here? I've taken all those tables, I've collapsed them into one, and if I want to get a particular product ID, I say select from this table where product ID equals two, and boom, here comes a hierarchical data structure that represents that product. Right. I, hey, I want to get all the tracks, you know, for 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 uh, uh, you know album two. Give me all the you know elements that start with an album ID and then a track indicator or something like that. Uh, right. I mean, there's lots of ways to play with this type of data. Think about you can create higher, you know, create and you know documents of any size can be supported using these types of item hier hierarchies. Um, <coughs> I can index any attribute. One of the limitations of DynamoDB today is if I use JSON attributes, I cannot index the attributes, the actual properties of the JSON object are not indexable. In hierarchies that are maintained this way, I can actually index every attribute. So those are the kind of reasons that I would use that. There's another way to maintain those hierarchies. It's probably, you could say, a little simpler, uh, would be to actually use JSON attributes. So this is the same data structure now that's being uh, you know, maintained on the, on the table as JSON attributes. And what I might do in this particular case, I'll project attributes to the root that I want to index on. right? So I actually pull attributes out of the JSON document, put those in as top level first class elements of the item itself so I can create indexes on those attributes. Now why would I choose one over the, over the other? In this particular case, I, I might say the items are small. So there's a write penalty if I do it like this. Right? Each one of these items cost me 1K, 1K, 1K. So it actually cost me four RCUs or WCUs to, to write this item. Now when I read the item, it's okay because it'll aggregate the read. But on the right, I pay a penalty. So if I'm writing and I have write heavy workload and I have really small JSON attributes I might, or JSON documents, I might choose to go this route because I can actually aggregate the write cost and just write it into one attribute. And then maybe there's a little bit of dupl duplicity there as I project those attributes up into the top level item to index on. But you know that's OK. I mean, it gives me the ability to support the access pattern. It's OK about one of the things about NoSQL you need to understand. Data duplication is OK. It's OK to have a little bit of you know, maybe I put that guy's name in the database a thousand times, right? Uh, because I don't really care about the cost of the storage. I care about the cost of the CPU, you know? I mean, the back in the day of normalized data is beautiful, right? Everything only appears once and we don't, de -du we don't duplicate the data anywhere, uh, but you pay for it. You pay for the cost. You pay for the, you know, the CPU that's required to, you know, pull that data in and out. 
of the database. So getting into scenarios and best practices, I won't talk to all of these. I don't think we have enough time. Uh, but I will talk to a couple of the ones that I feel are the most important. The idea here is we're talking about query filters versus composite key indexes. So in this particular example, I've got an online gaming scenario where my partition key is a game ID, and game, uh, game items have status. And so what I'm looking for is I want to actually write a query where I want to select star from the game table, where my opponent is Bob, and the status is pending, and I also want it ordered by the date, right? So we know that we can, you know, select the, from the partition key by, you know, the opponent's Bob. He's our partition key. Great, no problem. You know, we know we can sort on the order, and that's great. But what do we deal with this, you know, status? That's a, sec that's a third condition. How do we query on those three conditions, right? So, you know, the way we do that in DynamoDB is we write a filter condition. Okay, so you can, in essence, uh, select star from game where the opponent equals Bob, all right? No problem, I'm gonna get all the records where my opponent equals Bob. I'm gonna order by date. I got my range key there. Now I can pull back those three items and then I'm gonna apply the filter condition to those three items and return only the, only the ones that match it. So I'll, I'll, in essence, read more data than I'm gonna return to you. That's good for a query that's maybe not so selective, right? Uh, or, you know, that's, that's, that's not as selective as you need to be. Right, um, but it also costs because you're paying the extra RCU of reading the items that you're not returning. You're lowering the cost across the wire, a little bit less bandwidth, but you're still paying the RCU penalty. What I call is that's like needle in a haystack. Here's a bunch of hay, filter it out, right? Oh, look, we found the items we need. And that can, that's fine if you're not necessarily reading a ton of items and returning a few. If I'm, re if I'm reading a, like 100 items and I'm returning 90, then maybe that filter condition is not so painful. If I'm reading 100 items and I'm returning two, then maybe I'd, I'd rather have a more selective index, right? Uh, so how do we build more selective indexes? You know, again, you can use that query filter to return, the, turn, return less on the wire. You're still paying that read cost. Uh, but the way to build a selective index is use what we call composite keys, all right? In composite key scenario, what I'm going to do is concatenate the, the status and the date, and I create a new uh, composite key value called status date. Okay, and what does this do? If we look at the table structure now, you can see we are actually creating a nested sort, right? I'm sorted that table now not only by status, but by date. I can get all the uh, in-progress games sorted by date. You know, give me all the in-progress games for Carol that are, you know, that, you know that are, give me all the games for Carol that, that start with in-progress. Boom, I have a sorted list of, of her date, of her stat, you know, uh, in progress games by date. So when we, when we write this query now with the composite key, I say, hey, give me the, give me the games where the opponent equals Bob, and uh, it begins with pending. Now I have a much more selective result set, right? I filtered out off the, off the range query, and I don't have to read those items off the disk to return them back to the user. Uh, so this is more or less, uh, hey, let's get the hay, let's sort it all, and let's find, oh, that, that's, there's the needle. DynamoDB indexes by default are always sparse. Uh, you don't enable them, but they just are. If you uh, index an attribute and the attribute and insert an item on the table and it doesn't include that attribute, it just won't show up in the index. Uh, so that's a good way to create these types of sorted, uh, so highly selective indexes for in this particular case we do it like awards games might have billions of users or millions of users but they're not going to have millions of people winning you know the, the top awards right the top 10 the top 20 you know uh, so if I put attributes on specific users indicating the awards they've won I can now uh, provision a, a, a user's table with a very high write capacity or read capacity and an awards CSI with a very very low read write capacity because I know it's totally sparse for every million items I end up here, insert here, I'm gonna get 100 in the other table, right? So you can actually kind of run the math in your head and understand that the rate of insert in the, in the index is gonna be much lower than the table, and you can adjust capacity that way. So not always do indexes need to have the same write capacity as the parent table. Replace filters with indexes, concatenate attributes, create those composite keys. Uh, you know, take advantage of sparse indexes. These are all the strategies that you use when you want to optimize the uh, uh, result set or create as selective an index uh, as possible. So the other one that we want to talk to is a real-time voting scenario, and it's actually really about write-heavy items and, sh and, and hot keys. Hot keys are the things, the number one thing that I deal with the most with customers. You know, they just, they create some aggregation they don't understand. It's very, very thick aggregation, uh, <coughs> or, or, or it's very hot 
uh, access pattern, and they don't understand that what they're doing is nailing that workload to a single storage node. Uh, and so, you know, a typical scenario that starts this is a voting scenario, right? Uh, you got millions of people coming in to vote for things, and uh, really only one or two things are popular, right? Uh, so if I'm starting to aggregate all the votes for, for, uh, by candidate, what ends up happening is they all start coming in on a single partition, because single candidate ID, uh, and, you know, it becomes, creates problems in the data store, creates these hot keys. Uh, every NoSQL database suffers from this disease. So how do we stop that from happening? Well, the, the basic idea here is you create more candidates. Right? Instead of having just candidate A and candidate B, uh, I'm going to have candidate A with a series of, of random values in a known range. Right? Say candidate A 0 to 100. And then every time I get an insert, I'm going to just tack a random value between 0 and 100, or whatever, 0 and 10 in this example, I think, uh, onto the end of that candidate ID. And now, in essence, I've created more buckets. I can spread the votes across multiple buckets. When I go read the aggregation, I scatter gather all the results. You know, why does this work? It works because DynamoDB scales linearly across threads. And actually, single thread performance in DynamoDB is not great. You'll find that if you try to get, you know, increase the throughput by, you know, running, you know, a higher powered processor, you're not going to be able to do that. I mean, it's a, it's a web API, right? It's got to make a, you know, it's got to make a connection across the public internet. <coughs> uh, but it, what it does do is scales linearly across threads. So I can spin up any number of threads. I'll never break DynamoDB. The way people get millions of connections per, or millions of requests per second out of Dynamo is by running thousands of, of threads, right? Uh, not thousands necessarily, hundreds. Uh, but the idea is, you know, don't, 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 you know, single, single thread your workflow. Um, so you run this scatter gather process to go ahead and produce the aggregate result set, uh, and that, in essence, it, it now allows you to distribute the, 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 the aggregation across multiple buckets. I have many, many customers that deal with this. One of my customers is a, uh, they track prescription pill bottles. Every prescription pill bottle has a unique serial number, and they need to do things like track by, you know, a time period or aggregate by manufacturer or lot number, and literally billions and billions of items are shoving onto their tables, and they're spreading them out across, you know, a thousand buckets on their larger manufacturers. So a uh, very common access pattern to deal with, uh, or design pattern to deal with that high velocity uh, aggregations. Yeah, we talk a lot about what we call these days serverless architecture. It's the ability to use these backplane services like DynamoDB. Um, this chart actually shows you, you know, DynamoDB as well as a variety of other AWS services. Uh, I have many, many customers now that are building, you know, full-scale applications uh, using nothing but these backplane services. And, and these types of applications look like this. So uh, this is one that we actually wrote for uh, an internal app. We have a PMO uh, for the SAs, uh, the global SA team at, at AWS. And one of the requests came in was the ability to, to uh, collect what we call anytime feedback you know, from customers. Right now, internally, we have the ability to, do, to give any, any member of AWS or Amazon can give anybody else anytime feedback. And we like that system. And we wanted our customers to have uh, the ability to access that system. Uh, but in order to do that, we would have had to expose internal APIs that were just not built for public access. Uh, so we actually built an application. When we came back from the development team to build the app to do it, they, they said something like 17 uh, developer weeks, 12 PM weeks, uh, you know, to be able to put an RDS-backed application service out there. Uh, and we looked at it. This was the last you know, reInvent 4 last, right after we announced Lambda. Uh, and we looked at it and said, you know, this looks like something we should be able to do with Lambda. So we put a nice little form processing application together for Lambda to do exactly this. Uh, users basically get a, a email form, uh, you know, requesting you know feedback on the SA engagement. Uh, they 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 pull that form down from a secure uh, S3 bucket that's configured to operate as a web server, right? Uh, and they, that form, when they hit post, makes an AJAX call to the API gateway. API gateway logs the request, uh, parses the form data using a Lambda function, splits the PII personally identifying information out into an encrypted S3 bucket because we didn't want to store that off in Dynamo, um, you know, unencrypted, and then the uh, using the search metadata puts it up in DynamoDB uh, and then sends a little notification off to the hiring manager or the, or the SA manager and says somebody got feedback. Uh, <coughs> so this application was actually built in four hours in my spare time, one night in a hotel up in Seattle working with the PM. Uh, we went to production about three weeks after I wrote the initial prototype, uh, and you know, it basically took a 39-week uh, development effort and turned it into a part-time effort over two or three weeks. Uh, the application is really interesting to me because it, it actually, a hosting cost on this is about, oh, I don't know, a penny a month. 
you know, because I mean, literally, <laughs> literally, it's less than that. I mean, we have a couple of freaking things up in S3, and then we have an API gateway configuration that we don't even pay for until it's used, and we have a Lambda function configuration that doesn't get paid for until it's used, and customers, and we probably get 100, 150, uh, you know, form requests a month service from the customer, right? So, I mean, the Lambda cost, it's all free tier. Uh, you know, again, the application was built, designed, and deployed for less than the cost of my lunch, and, and yet it can scale to support a million users if they showed up tomorrow. I mean, how do you, I mean, that's the, that is the real power of what we talk about when we talk about serverless compute, is being able to leverage these backplane services to deliver applications that could stand up to an amazing amount of scale uh, at, at a ridiculously low cost. Right, I mean, it's uh, it's certainly a wave of the future. It's also a, a kind of a something that's showing us what what was the new thing with cloud. Right, it was all EC2 and VMs and virtual instances and on-demand you know servers and whatnot. That's now old news. We're beyond that. We're in the day of fully elastic compute, uh, backplane services like DynamoDB, API Gateway, and Lambda that let you do amazing things like this. Uh, and so that's what I got for you guys. Sorry we didn't get to go through the whole presentation, but thank you very much for listening.